Hello there. This lecture is an introduction to probability, and you've actually already been introduced to probability when you were looking at relative frequencies, when you were looking at frequency distribution tables. But this is going to be a more in-depth look into how to calculate basic probability. Well, organizations in today's business world face a great deal of uncertainty when they're making decisions, and probability is a really valuable tool for quantifying this uncertainty, so managers can make more informed decisions. So probability is abbreviated as P, and probability is really just a fancy word for likelihood. So you can think about the likelihood of something happening, or the probability of something happening, or the percent chance of something happening. So to get percent chance, you simply take the probability and you multiply by 100, and that gives you a percentage. Or if you want to figure out the probability based on a percent chance, you just kind of flip that equation. You take the percent chance, divide by 100, and that gives you the probability. Probability is also synonymous with the proportion, so the relative frequency of a specific event among all possible events. So typically, we will collect some data, we'll look at the proportion of specific events in that data, and then we will assume that the probability of those events happening in the future is equal to that proportion. So some examples of probability in business. So let's say that an e-commerce business wants to know the probability that a customer will make a purchase after browsing their website for more than 10 minutes. Well, if your P is low, your probability is low. P is just an abbreviation of probability. So if your P is low, you may want to reassess that inventory. Maybe the lack of purchase is not due to a lack of time. It's due to something that's wrong with the website, or maybe they aren't interested in the products that you have to offer. Another example, maybe a credit card executive wants to examine the probability that a customer with poor credit score will be late with their next payment. Well, in that case, if the P is high, if the probability is high, or there's a high percent chance that someone with a poor credit score will be late with their next payment, then you may avoid giving credit cards to those with poor credit. Another example, maybe a media consultant is asked to determine the probability that the viewing audience for the Super Bowl will exceed 130 million people. Well, if the probability is high, then maybe the channel that's airing the Super Bowl can justify charging top dollar for advertisement time. So just some kind of fun examples to show you how probability of outcomes in the past can be used to predict what's going to happen in the future to then make better decisions in your business. So just a very brief overview of the topics that I'm going to be covering. So first I'll give you some familiarity with some probability terms that I'll be using throughout the lecture. Then I'll show you the difference between classical and empirical probability. And unfortunately for our purposes, classical probability isn't that useful. This lecture really focuses on empirical probability. But classical probability is the kind of probability you'd be interested in if you wanted to hit the strip and gamble. But I'm not going to teach you how to count cards in this lecture. Then I'm going to move on to the probability rules for empirical probability, and there's two different types. There's one set of rules when you have independent events that don't influence each other, and then another set of rules when you have dependent events that do influence each other. Now, that, I want you to attempt all of the gold problems in this lecture without being tempted to look at the answers. So you'll notice that the answers are going to be verbalized, but will not be presented on the slides. So that being said, be prepared to take notes so that you'll have the answers to those gold problems. And again, try to attempt them before you get the answer from me. So just some terminology. An experiment is really just the process of measuring or observing an activity for the purpose of collecting data. So you could observe the condition and the method of arrival for hospital patients at St. Rose in a 24-hour period. Or you could roll a six-sided dice. So you're just observing outcomes. That's an experiment. Now this term sample space, which can be abbreviated SS, represents every single possible outcome or observation based on the number of trials that you're using. So basically just mapping out every single thing that can happen. That would be, all those outcomes would be your sample space. And then a simple event is just any potential outcome in the sample space. So anything that could possibly happen. Then when I said that you're mapping out your sample space, that's called a tree diagram.
So that's when you sketch the sample space to make sure that no outcomes are not included or repeated. So you're really just trying to prevent mistakes in determining the sample space. So to make a tree diagram, you start with each outcome for the first trial, and then you branch each outcome for each additional trial from those first set of outcomes in the first trial. This is really useful when multiple trials are involved to just kind of map out every possibility. Now tree diagrams are really more useful for classical probability, so I won't really show you a whole lot of examples, just one really. Um, but for empirical probability, we're going to be looking at frequency distribution tables for the most part. But it's important for you to be familiar with this terminology. So an event is abbreviated as an uppercase E. And this is just the outcome or observation of interest. It's really just a subset of the sample space, a subset of every possible outcome. What is the subset? Well, the events that you are actually interested in. So you could ask yourself, what is the probability that someone in good condition will walk in to the hospital instead of arriving in an ambulance or some other way? That would be an outcome of interest. Or back to the dice example, what is the probability of rolling two dice with a sum of five? That's your specific outcome of interest, your event. Then mutually exclusive events. So this is when you have two events that have absolutely no common outcomes. So if one event happens, that precludes the other event from happening. So for instance, if you arrive in an ambulance, you're not going to walk in, right? You can't do both. So the method of arrival to the hospital would be a mutually exclusive event. You can't walk in and show up in an ambulance. You can't show up in a helicopter and an ambulance at the same time. It's mutually exclusive. Similarly, if you roll a pair of sixes, then you know that you aren't rolling a two, for your first or second roll, or a three for your first or second roll. It's impossible. If you roll two sixes, you're not rolling any twos or threes. Again, mutually exclusive events. One happening precludes the other from happening. Then looking at dependent events. So this is when X, so just some event, has an impact on the probability of Y, some other event you're interested in. So you could say, what is the probability that someone will walk in when they are in good condition? So presumably, one's condition has an influence on the method of arrival. If you're in good condition, you're probably more likely to walk in than if you're in serious condition. So those are dependent events. You could also look at the dice example. So the value of the first die has an impact on the probability of getting the sum of five when you roll the next. So if you roll that first die and you get a six, you know that you're not going to have two dice rolls that give you a sum of five. It's just impossible. And finally, independent events. So this is a situation where X has no impact on the probability of Y. So for example, in the condition or method of arrival example, so whatever the condition or method of arrival for the first person observed has absolutely no impact on the condition or the method of arrival for the second person observed. So although for that one person, their condition probably does have an impact on their method of arrival, if you're randomly selecting two patients and looking at probabilities associated with condition and method of arrival, whatever's going on with that first patient is independent from what's going on with that second patient. So another example of independent events. This one's a little trickier. So if I ask, what's the probability that someone will be in good condition or walk in? A patient could do either or both and still be counted as an outcome of interest. So those would be kind of considered independent. And then back to the dice example. The sum of the first pair of dice is not related to the sum of the second pair of dice. So those would be independent events. If you got rolled two dice and got five, or rolled one die twice and got five the first time, it's not going to have an impact on what happens the second time you try that. All right. So let's start off with classical probability. And classical probability requires knowing the total number of possible outcomes in the sample space, which includes every possible event that can occur and is collectively exhaustive, right? The sample space includes everything that could possibly happen. So for example, the events of rolling a six-sided die and getting a one, two, three, four, or five, or six are collectively exhaustive. Because when we roll a single die, one of those outcomes is going to occur. It's either going to be a one, two, three, four, five, or six. Now classical probability requires that each simple event 
in the same sample space has an equal likelihood of occurring. So the chance of rolling a 1 for that die is the same as the chance of rolling a 2, same as the chance of rolling a 3. Every single side of that die has an equal chance of occurring when you roll the die. So for classical probability, the first step that usually occurs is you have to draw the sample space using a tree diagram. So mapping out every possible outcome for the total number of trials. Then you count the number of events of interest in that sample space using the tree diagram. Then you count the total number of all possible outcomes. And then finally you calculate the probability by taking the number of events of interest and dividing it by the total number of all possible outcomes. So if I was asking, what is the probability of getting a sum of 5 when rolling two dice? Well, first, you can see that this is classical probability because there is an equal chance of every single roll happening. And we can map out every single possible event in our sample space. And then when we do our tree diagram, so this represents trial 1, this first set of numbers. So you can get a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6 for that first roll. And then in the next roll, you could get, so if you got a 1, you could get a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6 for the second roll. If you rolled a 2, you could get a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6 for the second roll, so on and so forth. So now that we have our tree diagram, we need to figure out how many situations are going to result in the sum of 5 for two dice rolls. So, if we look at the, this right here, we could say, okay, if you start off with a 1, you're going to have to get a 4 to get a sum of 5. So that would be one situation where you would get a sum of 5. No other second rolls after you roll a 1 are going to give you 5. If you roll a 2, you must get a 3 to get the sum of 5. If you roll a 2, that's the only thing that you can roll the second time, 3, to get a sum of 5. If you roll a 3, your second roll needs to be a 2 to get a sum of 5. If you start off rolling a 4, your second roll needs to be a 1 to get a sum of 5. Now, if you roll a 5, it's impossible to roll a second die and get a sum of 5, right? Because there's no zeros on that six-sided die. So once you roll a 5, you're done. You're not going to end up with the event of interest. Similarly, with the 6, once you roll a 6, you're not going to get a sum of 5. There's no negative 1 on the next die that you roll. So we had 1 and 4, roll a 2 and then a 3, roll a 3 and then a 2, roll a 4 and then a 1. So there's only four possible scenarios where we're going to have the event of interest, where we're going to get a sum of 5. Now we want to see what are the total number of all possible outcomes. So you simply count the last column of numbers in your tree diagram. So if you count all these boxes, you end up with 36 total possible two dice rolls. So there's four of those rolls that end up in a sum of five out of a total of 36, and your probability is 0.111. If you turn this into a percent chance, that means that you have 11.1% chance of having two dice rolls of a six-sided die and ending up with a sum of five. Now here, we are mapping out a tree diagram for the probability of someone walking into the hospital who's in good condition. So we have all the different conditions represented here, good, fair, serious, and critical, and then all the methods of arrival represented here. So someone could come in, be in good condition and walk in, come in an ambulance, come in a helicopter, or be brought in by a prison guard if they're in prison. Someone could be in fair condition and could walk in, arrive in an ambulance, be in a helicopter, or be brought in by a prison guard. So you see, Every single condition is represented, and then after every single condition is every single method of arrival. This is problematic, though. We can't say, oh, all right, they're in good condition, and they walk in. Boom. One out of 16 possible outcomes, and say, oh, the probability is 0 0.063. That is not accurate. This is not a true classical probability situation where we can just use the tree diagram based on the sample space and no probabilities, because each event does not have an equal likelihood of occurring. There's probably fewer people who are in critical condition than are in good condition. It's not an equal chance of condition. And there's probably a lot more people who walk in or come in an ambulance than show up in a helicopter or being brought in by a prison guard. So this is not 
a good use of classical probability. And the reason I don't focus on classical probability in this lecture is because it is pretty rare to have a situation where each event has an equal likelihood of occurring in the business world. So when we do not have the information needed to determine the number of outcomes associated with an event, or if there's no known sample space, or when each outcome is not equally likely, we are going to rely on a sample of observations to predict or estimate the probabilities of events in the future. For example, a hospital administrator wants to know the probability of each arrival method for any given patient to help determine staffing needs for helicopter pilots, ambulance drivers, and paramedics versus front desk clerks who check in walk-ins. Or we want to know the proportion of arrival methods based on conditions to see if patients are overusing the ambulances. Both of those examples, we are going to use data that was collected in the past to anticipate future needs. So classical probability is no help here because the probability of each arrival method and condition is not equal. Although you can map the sample space like you saw in that tree diagram, you can map the sample space for any given patient. Which event occurs is not simply due to chance. It's due to a variety of factors. So for instance, money, availability of transportation, age, your insurance coverage, all those things are going to have an impact on your method of arrival. You could even suggest that some of those things would have an impact on your condition and how well you're doing. So it's not a true random event. There's not an equal probability for every single simple event in that sample space. So in this case, empirical probability can be used to count arrival method and condition over a period of time, and then that can be used to estimate the probability of conditions and arrival methods. So I'm using the word estimate here because even though you're using past observations to predict future observations, it may not be a perfect prediction, but it's better than just guessing. So empirical probability requires matched conditions so just having conditions that are representative of the outcome of interest and having a large number of observations. So you need to have matched conditions so you're collecting data in the same type of situation that you're wanting to predict probabilities in and you are collecting a large amount of data. You have a large sample size in other words. Those two conditions need to be met to have any chance of an accurate prediction of the probability of an event. So you have to ask yourself if you're looking at, you're collecting data one day at the ER at St. Rose, and let's say there's 197 patients who arrived that day. You have to ask yourself, would the 197 patients who arrived today be representative of all the patients in the future? So you have to be careful with the match conditions, right? Try not to collect data on a day with extreme circumstances. So for instance, you wouldn't want to base your predictions on New Year's Eve when there's a lot more alcohol being consumed, a lot more injuries happening, and people are probably drunk and not able to drive to the hospital. So probably not going to be walking in so much. So you wouldn't want to collect data just on like New Year's Eve or even one single day. It's probably better to collect data on multiple days or a random selection of days over the course of the year. So getting at the large number of observations, that's what I'm talking about there. You know, you want to try to collect as much data as possible. Even though it's not always possible due to, you know, time constraints or limited access, in a perfect world, you're going to be able to have a lot of data to look at that represents the types of situations you're trying to, you, to predict probabilities in. All right, so just general probability rules. Remember I said probability just indicates the chance or the likelihood of a specific event. And you've seen these before and I mentioned them earlier. To find the probability or proportion, you can call it proportion or probability, you take the percent chance divided by 100. If you want to get the percent chance based on the probability, you take the probability and multiply it by 100. So the probability for one event is never going to be a negative number. Think in terms of percentages, right? You can never have a situation where you have a negative 5% chance that something's going to happen. You're just never going to have negatives. Now, the probability, if it equals 1, remember, P times 100 gives you percent. That would be like saying there's a 100% chance. So that's a certain outcome. It will certainly happen if there's a 100% chance of it happening. If you have a p-value or a probability of 0, then that means there's a 0% chance that something's going to happen. Now that's also a certain outcome. You're certain it's not going to happen. 
what we are usually concerned with is the probability that's between 0 and 1, so that margin of uncertainty. And as the probability gets closer to 1 or closer to a 100% chance, then we're more certain that that particular event is going to happen. But as the probability gets closer to 0 or a 0% 0 chance, we are really less certain that it's going to happen. We're predicting that it's probably not likely to occur. Another general probability rule is that if you add up all the probabilities for all of the simple events for a single variable, you will get 1. So for instance, if I was looking at the probability of randomly selecting a male or a female from our class, and let's say that 60% were females and 40% were males, or in other words, point, probability of 0 0.60 of randomly selecting a female, probability of 0 0.40 of randomly selecting a male. If I wanted to know the probability of selecting either male or female, assuming we don't have any hermaphrodites in the class, it would be 1, right? Or there's a 100% chance that you're randomly going to select a male or female. Now the complement to an event is the probability that something will not happen. And the way that you figure that out, if you think 1 represents the probability of any event happening, right, all possible all possibilities, right, 1, and then you subtract the probability of the specific event, then you will end up with the probability that the event won't happen. So if you look at this in words, 1 represents the probability that any outcome will happen, and then you're subtracting the probability that the event will not happen. So for instance, if I want to know the probability of randomly selecting a female, assuming that we already know that there's 0 0.40 males probability of 0 0.40 for males, probability of 0 0.60 for females. You could also find that 0 0.60 just knowing that the probability of randomly selecting a male is 0 0.40. So you could say 1, the probability of either male or female, minus 0 0.40, probability of a male, would give you 0 0.60, probability of randomly selecting a female. So here's an example, and this table should not look foreign to you. You've constructed these before. This is just a relative frequency distribution table. And just to break it down for you, in a 24-hour period, let's say we observed 132 walk-ins at St. Rose, 61 arrived in an ambulance, 2 arrived in a helicopter, and 2 were brought in by a prison guard, representing a total sample size of 197 patients. Then to find the relative frequency or the probability of each, you can say, all right, 132 out of 197 arrived by being a walk-in. So 132 divided by 197 is 0 0.670. And you see that all the way down. And just to reinforce that rule, notice that the p-value or the probability for all events, so the total, is 1 because Every event observed, method of arrival, in the sample space is included in this table. So there is a 100% chance that somebody walked in, was in an ambulance, was in a helicopter, or was brought in by a prison guard. So if you're looking at this table, and pretty much all the work's already done for you here, and you were asked, what is the probability that someone would arrive in a helicopter? So based on this observation of 24 hours, what is the probability that we would predict to see of someone arriving in a helicopter? So that would be 2 out of 197, which is 0 0.01. Now remember the complement rule, right? So, if we knew that the probability of arriving in a helicopter is 0.01, what's the probability of not arriving in a helicopter? So the probability of any method of arrival is 1 minus the probability of arriving in a helicopter, 0.01, and you get a probability of 0.99 of somebody not arriving in a helicopter based on this data. You could also say that the proportion of helicopter arrivals in this 24-hour period was 0.01, or 1% of patients arrived by helicopter, and the, prob the proportion of non-helicopter arrivals in this data was 0.99, or 99% of patients arrived some other way than a helicopter. If you're talking about proportions or the percentage of the sample, that's certain, right? You know what the percentage of the sample is. But if you're then using that to make predictions about the future, then you're using the word, you know, probability or percent chance, and there's always a certain level of uncertainty with those types of predictions. So now I want you to pause this video and attempt the problems in gold there, and then resume the video when you're finished, and I will talk about the answers to those. 
All right. So the probability that, based on this data, the probability that somebody will walk in. So you look at walk-ins, there's 132 walk-ins divided by 197. You see that here. The probability is 0 0.670. Then if you flip that, right, well, if we know there's a, for example, 67% chance that someone's going to walk in, then what's the percent chance or the probability that someone will not walk in? Well, you could just take 1 minus 0.67. And you get 0.33 is the probability that someone will not walk in, that they'll arrive some other way. Or you could say there's a 33% chance that the next patient arriving is going to be a non-walk-in based on this data. So now let's look at probability rules for independent events. So making it a little bit more complicated than what you are used to looking at relative frequencies. So here we are looking at a single variable method of arrival with outcomes that cannot overlap. So you can't, you know, show up in an ambulance and be a walk-in. These are mutually exclusive outcomes. So when you're looking at a single variable with outcomes that cannot overlap and the word or is involved, like helicopter or ambulance, you're probably looking at the addition rule for individual outcomes. So this data involves those mutually exclusive events, again, because there's no overlap, because a single patient cannot arrive in multiple ways. In most cases, empirical probability is used to anticipate events, so predicting the probability or likelihood of future events. So again, you could say, based on the past 24 hours, the estimated probability of the next patient arriving in a helicopter or ambulance is 0.32, or a 32% chance. And I got that by saying, so if you look at this formula or this formula, you could find this two ways. So if I'm using the sum of probabilities for each event, what's the probability of arriving in a helicopter or ambulance? You just add the probability for helicopter to the probability for ambulance. So 0.01 plus 0.31 gives you 0.32. Or you could say, okay, well, the cells of interest, so I'm looking at 61 ambulance arrivals and two helicopter arrivals. 61 plus 2 is 63, boom, divided by the total number of patients, 197, and you still end up with 0.32. So that 32% chance that the next patient will arrive in a helicopter or ambulance based on this data. But of course, there's several factors that may impede the accuracy of this estimate, like the limited time of observation. Maybe this was on a Monday and there's more drunk driving and the need for life flights on the weekend. I don't know. Again, I'm just trying to emphasize that we are uncertain about our predictions, but these predictions are better than just going off our gut feeling. Now, again, if you were simply interested in this 24-hour period of data collection and did not have the goal of using this observation to predict future events, you could say the proportion of arrivals by helicopter or ambulance was 0.32, or 32% of arrivals were via helicopter or ambulance on this specific day. Now I want you to try this problem right here. So what is the probability that the next patient who walks in will, or who, the next patient who arrives will be a walk-in or a prison guard? And what is the probability that the next patient who arrives will not be a walk-in or brought in by a prison guard? So go ahead and pause this video and give this a try. Okay. So using those two different methods for finding this, the first one would be to add the probabilities together. So walk-in or prison guard, walk-in, probability 0.67, prison guard, probability of 0 0.01, add those two together, you get 0.68. Or you could add the frequencies for those two outcomes of interest and divide by the total number of frequencies. So you could say, all right, 132 walk-ins plus two prison guard gives you 134. 134 divided by 197 is 0.68. Either way you go, you're going to get the same probability. Then you just use the complement rule to find not walk-in or prison guard. So if they aren't a walk-in or prison guard, and we know that the probability of walk-in or prison guard is 0.68, you just take 1 minus 0.68 and you end up with 0.32. Now, because you already have these probabilities, you could also say, okay, if they're not a walk-in or a prison guard, then they're an ambulance or a helicopter, and 0.31 plus 0.01 is 0.32. But it's important for you to understand the, the complement rule because you won't always have access to all that information. So 
when you are looking at a single variable, such as method of arrival, with outcomes that cannot overlap and the word and is involved, so ambulance and ambulance are both arrived in an ambulance, it's an and situation, then you're probably looking at the multiplication rule for independent events. So the way that you would find this is you simply multiply the probability of each event of interest. So if we look at this, if you selected two patients at random, what is the probability that both would have arrived in an ambulance? This is an and situation, right? Ambulance and ambulance for those two patients selected. Well, if we look at the probability of arriving in an ambulance, we see that it is 0.31. And since we have two patients, then we would just say 0.31 times 0.31 and get our probability. Now, you could also look at the probability that the next three patients selected at random would be an ambulance, and you would just have 0.31 times 0.31 times 0.31. Or if you selected three patients at random, what's the probability that two would arrive in an ambulance and one would arrive in a helicopter? So 0.31 times 0.31 times 0.01. Whatever your events are, however many they are, you just multiply them all together. If you have a situation where you have a single variable with outcomes that cannot overlap and you're using the word and, or you're just assuming that all of those things are going to happen. So now I want you to give this one a try. Pause the video, give it a shot, see what you come up with. All right, so the first one is looking at what is the probability of the next two patients walking in? So you would just take the probability for a walk-in, which is 0.67, and multiply it by itself because you have two patients. So 0.67 times 0.67, and you get 0.449. So based on this sample, I would guess that there's a 44.9% chance that the next two patients will be a walk-in. Then if you look at the next example. So what is the probability of randomly selecting two patients, one who arrived in an ambulance and one who arrived in a helicopter from this sample? So the probability of arriving in a helicopter is 0.01 times the probability of arriving in an ambulance, 0.31, and you get 0 0.003. So you could say, based on this data, there is a 0.3% chance that a random sample of two patients will include one helicopter arrival and one ambulance arrival. Now this is much different from the probability of arriving in a helicopter or an ambulance. Remember that was 0.32 in a previous slide and that's because it's far less likely that you're going to have two random patients, one who arrived in an ambulance and one who arrived in a helicopter, than it is to say okay this next person, whoever arrives, could either have arrived in an ambulance or a helicopter. So one is a lot less likely and they are totally different probabilities. So you also need to be prepared for word problems. And typically, word problems will include percentages. And just remember that to get the probability from a percentage, you just take the percentage and divide by 100. So let's look at this example. So if you know, based on past experience, that there's a 3% chance that a terminated employee will try to sue the company for wrongful termination, and a 55% chance that any employee will be terminated. And let's say that you just terminated two employees and you want to know what is the probability that both of these employees will sue. So the probability, they've already been terminated, right? And we know, so right here, they've already been terminated. There's a 3% chance that terminated employees will sue. So take that 3%, divide by 100, you get 0 .03. 0 0.03 times 0 0.03, right? Because we're looking at two employees and the chance that they'll sue, P equals 0 0.03. And you get 0 0.001. Now I want you to pause this video and give this next one a try. So suppose that you just terminated three employees. What's the estimated probability that all three will sue? Okay, so before we were looking at two employees, so we only had 0 .03 times 0 .03. Now you're looking at three employees, still looking at the same type of thing. There's a 3% chance that a termina terminated employee will try to sue. So three terminated employees, the probability that all three will sue would be 0 0.03 times 0 0.03 times 0 0.03, and you get 0 0.000027, or 0 0.00003 if you round it. Now, that being said, do not round to the thousands place if the value in the thousands place will be zero. 
If that's the case, then you need to round to the place with the first value other than zero. So in this case, 0 .000027, you wouldn't want to put 0 .000 as your answer because that's not accurate. It's not, it's impossible. So you need to go out to at least the point where you have a value. So instead of 0 .000, 000, you would have 0 .00003. Okay. So up until now, we focused on the probability of a single event. However, in the business world, situations are rarely this simple. Most times they involve two or more events that intersect with one another. For example, a hospital may want to know how the method of arrival to the ER and the medical condition intersect. So if you have two variables that occur simultaneously and you see the word or, you are probably dealing with the addition rule for two non-exclusive events. So in this example, what if we need to know the probability that the next ER patient will come in an ambulance or be in good condition? So in this case, we're looking for everything in this Venn diagram, right? Either coming in an ambulance or being in good condition. So we're looking at a patient in good condition who arrived in any way and patients in any condition who arrived in an ambulance. You have to be careful though. Be sure not to double count those patients who arrived in an ambulance and in good condition. So you have to make sure you don't double count the middle of this Venn diagram here. So the way that you do this is you take the number of cells of interest divided by the total number of observations. So in this case, if we're looking at good condition or an ambulance, so we're looking at all these people and all these people. But again, make sure you do not double count those people who were in good condition and arrived in an ambulance. So the way that you would do this is you'd say, okay, 90 plus 7 plus 0 plus 1. Don't count this again. So plus 20 plus 22 plus 12 plus 61. And you end up with 152. Then you take that total. That's the total number for the cells of interest while not double counting the one that overlaps between the two, divide that by the total number of patients in this case, 197 patients, and you get 0.772. So this table looks a little bit different because now we're looking at a joint frequency distribution table where we are looking at, so for instance, these people were in good condition and walked in, these people were in good condition and arrived in an ambulance, and so on and so forth. So the total that you're looking at, the total number of observations, will be this total over here by either adding up all the different methods of arrival or adding up all the different conditions. You get the same, same answer for the total number of observations. So now I want you to go ahead and pause this video and try to figure out these two probabilities. Okay. So if we want to know the probability that the next ER patient will arrive in a helicopter or be in critical condition, we are going to be looking at these cells, so the critical cells, and the helicopter cells. All right, so just to make sure we don't double count, we could say, okay, all the criticals, 12 plus 2, and then, so I'm going to ignore these zeros, and then here for the helicopters, there's zeros until we get to the critical side of 2. So we don't really want to double count this. So we would just have 12 plus 2 is 14. 14 divided by 197 is 0.071. And that would be your answer for this first one. Now for this next one, what if we want to know the probability that the next ER patient will not arrive in a helicopter or be in critical condition? Well, the simple way to do this is to use the complement rule. So we could say we already know that the probability of being in critical condition or arriving in a helicopter was 0 0.071. So we could simply say 1 minus 0 0.071 and you get 0 0.929 would be the probability there. Again, these estimates are based on limited information, but it's a prediction that we're using based on past data. So you need to use this formula when you do not have access to the frequencies. It works with the frequencies too, but the other formula is easier to use when you have access to the frequencies. So I didn't show you how to use this particular formula when you have the joint frequency distribution table. 
but you're still using this formula to avoid double counting those events that include both criteria. So we're still subtracting the joint probability or the co-occurrence of the two events of interest. So the middle of this Venn diagram here. So if we're looking at this example, and well, let me just show you the formula and walk you through it. So this is the sum of the probabilities for each event. And then you subtract the co-occurrence co of the two events. So this would be like this and this, right? Adding those two together. And then we're subtracting the middle of that Venn diagram. All right. So based on personnel records, you know that 30% of employees use five or more sick days per year. You also know that 10% of employees use five or more personal days per year, and 5% of employees do both. So that would be the co-occurring, right? Both events. They do five or more sick days and five or more personal days per year. So what percent of employees use five or more personal days per year or five or more sick days per year? So the way that you would figure that out is you would take the probability of five or more sick days plus the probability of five or more personal days and then subtract those who did both. So the probability of sick and five plus sick and personal days. So you end up with, so you take this 30% divide by 100 to get a p-value of 0 0.30 plus this 10% here, right? So 30% use five or more sick days, 10% or p equals 0 0.10 use five or more personal days, and then subtract 5%, p becomes 0 0.05, employees who did both. You end up with, so 0 0.30 plus 0 0.10 is 0 0.40 minus 0 0.05, 0 0.35, or a 35% chance that employees will use five or more personal days per year or five or more sick days per year. Or you could say 35% of employees use five or more personal days per year or five or more sick days per year. Okay, so now I want you to pause this video and try out this similar problem. And again, we're just assuming that that raw data we were looking at before doesn't apply and we have some new data based on observation here. And we don't know what the frequencies are. All right, so if we're looking at this, we will want to take, using that formula that you saw on the previous slide, so the sum of the probabilities for each event occurring separately and subtracting the sum, or subtracting the probability of the co-occurrence. So we would have the probability of being in critical condition plus the probability of arriving in a helicopter minus the probability of being in critical condition and arriving in a helicopter. So the probability of being in critical condition, so 20% becomes 0 0.20. The probability of arriving in a helicopter, so 7% divided by 100 becomes 0 0.07. And then the probability of being in critical condition and arriving in a helicopter, 5% divided by 100, 0.05. So 0.20 plus 0.07 minus 0.05 gives you 0.22. Or you could say there 22% of patients were in critical condition or arrived in a helicopter. All right, now let's look at probability rules for dependent or conditional events. So if you have a situation where you have two variables that occur simultaneously and you see the word and, meaning both conditions must be met, you're dealing with the multiplication rule for dependent events. Now you'll notice that this formula is the same as the addition rule for any two non-exclusive events, but there will only be one cell of interest in the table. So basically, whereas before we were making sure that we didn't double count one of those cells, but we were looking at tons of different cells, in this case, we're really just looking at the double counting, right? In this case, we are only interested in the middle of the Venn diagram, whereas before we were trying to remove it when we were looking at, I think, good condition and ambulance, or good condition or ambulance. We were trying to remove those who experienced both. Well, now we want to just know the proportion that experienced both of these. So you want to know how likely the intersection of the two events is, this middle of the Venn diagram. So in this case, we want to know what's the probability that any given patient is in serious condition and, keyword, and walked in. So we look at walk-ins, serious condition. Where do those two intersect? There's 12 people who walked in in serious condition. 
and we take that 12, divide it by the total number of observations, all 197 patients, and you get 0 0.061. So now go ahead and use that formula and give this one a try. So pause the video and see if you can figure it out. All right, so what is the probability that any given patient is in good condition and walked in? So you look to see where good condition and walk-in intersect right here. 90 patients in this sample were in good condition and walked in, divided by a total of 197 patients. And you get 90 divided by 197 is 0.457. So that would be the probability. So if you're in a situation where you have no access to the joint frequency distribution table, but you know the probabilities or the percent chances, then you can use this formula here. So you can just take the probability of the first event multiplied by the probability of the second event once the first event has already occurred. This is referred to as conditional probability, and we'll get to that next. But if you want to see this in symbols, this is the probability of the first event times the probability of the second event once the first event has already occurred. So let's say based on past experience, you know there's a 3% chance that a terminated employee will try to sue the company for wrongful termination and a 55% chance that any employee will be terminated. What is the percent chance that any given employee will be terminated and will then file a lawsuit? So we're not only looking at, oh, like in the last example when we were using this data, we were assuming that they were already terminated. Now we are looking at all employees and trying to figure out what percentage will be terminated, and then we'll file a lawsuit. So we have the probability of the first event, which is being terminated, times the probability that once they're terminated, they will sue. So the probability of being terminated, 55% divided by 100, 0.55, times the probability that they'll sue when they're terminated, 3% divided by 100, 0.03, and you get 0.017, turn that into a percent chance, and there's a 1.7% chance that any given employee is going to end up suing you for wrongful termination after they were terminated. It's kind of scary. It's too high for my liking. All right, now I want you to give this example a try. Pause the video and see what you come up with. All right, so if we're looking at the probability of the first event, so the probability of being terminated is 0.55, and then the probability of sending a threatening letter once you're terminated is 0.01, and 0.55 times 0.01 gives you 0.006, so there's a 0.6% chance that any given employee will be terminated and will then send a threatening letter. Now this is less likely than the previous example because 3% of terminated employees sue whereas only 1% of terminated employees send a threatening letter. So it's less likely that they'll send a threatening letter and be terminated or be terminated and then send a threatening letter. All right, the last rule. So this conditional probability of any two events. I kind of alluded to it in the last example, but here we go. So now we are no longer simply looking for the intersection of two events. Now we are assuming the probability of the prerequisite and must include the probability of the prerequisite or the first event in the calculation for the overall probability of the event. So it's not just this and this, right? We are assuming that something occurred first. So if you have two variables that occur simultaneously and you see the word when, y depends on x and we assume x already happened, right? The word when you're probably dealing with the conditional probability of any two events. Now luckily, this isn't too foreign to you when you're using frequency distribution tables. This is just like the joint relative to group total frequ relative frequency when you have access to the frequencies. So this is kind of akin to F divided by N group, right? So the joint frequency for the two event events of interest divided by the frequency associated with the first event that happened or the group of interest that you're looking at. So right here you see joint relative to group total is what we're looking at essentially. And then these little symbols, so E first just means the first event, the prerequisite, the condition, right, conditional probability, it's based on a certain condition that occurred first. Then E second is the second event that happened after that first event occurred. So it's conditional upon the first event. 
and the order of event matters in this case. And you'll see that in these examples. It's very important to pay attention to what came first. All right, so let's go ahead and look at an example. So suppose the hospital administrator is interested in estimating the overuse of ambulances. And we need to know the probability that the next ER patient will come in an ambulance when they are in good condition. So the prerequisite in this case would be that they're in good condition, right? They will come in an ambulance when they are in good condition. So the when, the prerequisite, falls after the little line in the formula, if that helps you when you're writing this down, when you're doing the symbols. So again, probability that next ER patient will come in an ambulance when they are in good condition. So we're only interested in the patients who are in good condition. That's our group that we are interested in. All right. So what proportion of patients in good condition arrive in an ambulance is another way to say it. Or out of all people in good condition, what proportion arrives in an ambulance? All right. So good condition, ambulance. That's the joint frequency for good condition and ambulance, seven. So that's where seven comes from. And then remember, we're only looking at those who arrived or who were in good condition. So what proportion of patients in good condition, these guys arrive in an ambulance? Seven out of 98, 0 0.071. Then the second example, if we're looking at, well, another way you could say this, um, multiply by 100, 7.1% of patients in good condition arrive in an ambulance. But what if we rephrase this question? And we wanted to know what proportion of patients who arrive in an ambulance are in good condition. So trying to anticipate their condition based on how they arrived. Another way to say this, what is the probability that the next ER patient will be in good condition when they come in an ambulance? Or out of all people arriving in an ambulance, what proportion is in good condition? So we say we're really only interested in those who arrived in an ambulance. So these 61 patients who arrived in an ambulance. And out of all those ambulance arrivals, how many were in good condition? Well, seven were. So now we have seven divided by 61 gives you 0.115. See how the order is important, right? So 7.1% of patients in good condition arrive in an ambulance. So out of all those in good condition, 7.1% come in an ambulance. But out of all those who arrive in an ambulance, 11.5% are in good condition. All right. Now I want you to give this one a try. Pause the video and see what you come up with. Okay. So now the hospital administrator is worried that people who are in serious condition, maybe they don't have good insurance or they're afraid of ambulances, I don't know, but maybe they're in serious condition and they end up walking into the ER. And the administrator is kind of worried about this and wants to know what proportion walk in when they're in serious condition. So we say, okay, we're only interested in the people who are in serious condition. So these 35 patients. And out of those 35 patients, 12 walked in. So 12 divided by 35 gives you 0.343. So based on this data, the hospital administrator should probably worry because 34.3% of patients in serious condition will walk in. Keeping in mind, that's not the same as saying 34.3% of patients are in serious condition and walk in. That's a different type of probability. Okay. So here's another situation where you don't have access to the frequencies. You don't have the joint frequency distribution table, but you know the probabilities. So you can use this formula here to figure out the conditional probability of any two events. So you have to be mindful. There's usually two separate versions of the formula. One is used when you have the frequencies and one is used when you don't. So this is saying the co-occurrence of the two events divided by the occurrence of the first event or the prerequisite or the condition. So be sure to provide decimals when you're asked for probabilities or proportions and then p times 100 equals a percent when you're asked for percentages. So try to be careful. If you make a mistake, I'm not going to be too upset about it, but just when you're out in the real world, if you're asked for a percentage, make sure you turn it into a percentage. Okay, so we're looking at this, and we see, all right, based on personnel data, you know that 20% of employees had no missed days and scored high on their performance appraisal last quarter. You also know that 55% of employees had no missed days last quarter. 
what percentage of employees had high performance when they had no missed days. So we're only looking at those who had no missed days. So that is our when, our condition. So that is our first event. And we want to know out of all of those who had no missed days, how many of them did well on their performance appraisal. So the way we figure that out, we take 0.20. So the co-occurrence, right? 20%, 20% divided by 100 gives you 0.20. Employees who had no missed days and had a good performance appraisal divided by 0.55. So the proportion of employees with no missed days, that condition, and you get 0.364 or a 36.4% of employees had high performance when they had no missed days. All right, go ahead and give this next one a try. Pause the video and see what you come up with. Okay, so in this example, we're looking at this. We're, so the P, E first, and E second, the co-occurrence. So we know that patients who walk in and are in serious condition was 0 0.075. And then the first event being in serious condition Right, because we want to know probably the patient will walk in when they are in serious condition. So we're only concerned with those in serious condition. And the proportion of those in serious condition was 0 0.30. So you have 0 0.075 divided by 0 0.30, and you get 0.25. All right, so we're all done. Just keep in mind that probability is a key way to improve business decisions. And probability allows you to determine the likelihood of many business-related outcomes including customer behaviors like purchasing and complaints, employee behaviors like quitting, improving performance based on training, defects and parts, success of new initiatives like training and expansion, and trying to predict what's going to happen in general, like these hospital examples that we've been looking at. However, your predictions are only as good as the source of your data, so always try to have a really large sample that represents the population. So try to have many observations that are relevant to the outcomes of interest that you're trying to predict.